Omaha's news leader, chronicling the stories and people making a difference in our community. This is KETV News Watch 7's Chronicle. Good morning and thanks for joining us. I'm David Earl. Well, it's been nearly two years since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic and we are not out of the woods yet. You may be exhausted and frustrated, and if you feel that way, you're not alone. But despite rising case counts, we have come a long way. We're going to look at the progress from testing to treatments, and you'll hear from UNMC's Dr. James Lawler, who's been a top resource throughout the pandemic on the future of the virus and how it might impact us in the years to come. First, we've seen COVID-19 testing go from sites run by Test Nebraska to private clinics working to meet the need, and now to people swabbing from the comfort of their own home. This month, the federal government is set to send out half a billion at-home test kits starting this week. KETV Newswatch 7's Joey Savchik spoke to rural health leaders who say the boost to supply could be a game changer. In rural Nebraska, at-home test kits are in high demand. We get at least three or four calls a day for them. But pharmacies are facing low supply. Typically, we're out of stock and kind of scrambling to get any of them into stock. At Kubot Pharmacy in Fremont, the few rapid tests on the shelves likely won't last long. I would say probably tomorrow they'll be gone. There is on-site testing in rural Nebraska. There are places that do testing every day. But access isn't as easy as it is in metro areas. I think it's a little bit harder to get in and get tested every day. As you can see on this map, Nomi Health has test sites in Omaha, Lincoln, and Grand Island, but options in between are limited. I think being in the rural areas, having access, um, accessibility to be able to get them at a faster rate is a really big thing. In Iowa, Pottawatomie Public Health has take-home tests, one option for rural communities, but those people have to bring them back for results or drop them off at UPS. At least it's easier for them to get to. They can even keep it on hand in case they decide they need one or aren't feeling well. While some national pharmacies have limited the number of at-home COVID tests you can buy to four or six, Kubot says they're lucky if they even have that many in supply. While testing can help battle the spread of COVID, medical experts say we need to increase vaccinations to win the war against the virus. Can we test our way out of it? I don't think we can. Well, if you do test positive for the virus, there are treatment options that will keep you out of the hospital, including monoclonal antibodies. Those are recommended for people 12 years and older who are at high risk. The FDA has also recently authorized two pills to treat the virus. But as Dr. James Lawler at UNMC tells me, these options are not as effective in the battle against COVID as the vaccines are. For the antivirals and, and the monoclonal antibodies, uh, that those have been huge breakthroughs in terms of saving people individually, uh, and they have a significant effect in reducing hospitalization and, and death. But they are not easily scalable like a vaccine is. There's a lot of logistics involved in, first of all, just getting a test in somebody to make sure that you've diagnosed that they have COVID, getting that test in a time period that allows you to treat them early enough, these medications will be effective. Having supplies available, we're already seeing significant shortages in the uh, monoclonal antibody that we know works effectively against Omicron. Many of the monoclonal products that we had previously been using for Delta and other variants uh, do not appear to be effective against Omicron. And then the new antiviral medications, uh, we only have uh, really extensive use of one remdesivir that we've used for a long time. Now we have two new products um, which have just come online, Molnupiravir and, and Paxlovid, but both of those are going to be in short supply uh, for the near future. So uh, we're really not going to have the, the volume of, um, of treatments that we need to make a huge impact. And, and the majority of uh, hospitalizations and deaths, unfortunately, are still going to happen. And, and so vaccine continues to be our best defense uh, against uh, overwhelming our hospitals and, and adding to the already tragic number of deaths that we've experienced. And it has been just over a year since the first boxes of the COVID-19 vaccine reached health systems here in the metro. KETV Newswatch 7's Catherine Garcia spoke with healthcare workers about what they have learned since then and the ongoing vaccination efforts. 
Exactly one year ago, One World Health received its first shipment of the Pfizer vaccine. Nancy Luna remembers the joy in the room. We worked so hard to help the community and being there firsthand um, and knowing that the vaccine was here was like, oh my gosh, so much hope. One World focused first on meatpacking plant workers. It was a great experience. It was emotional too, just to be there and vaccinate so many people who actually needed it, you know, who were affected with COVID-19 from the start. The health system applied strategies from those clinics to the rest of the community. Between vaccinating on site, providing education, going on radio stations, doing our outreach events door to door, uh, taking the vaccine to the people, which includes packing houses and restaurants and daycares, the homeless shelter. A year later, the Hispanic population has the highest vaccination rate in Douglas County, with more than 77%, 18 and up, fully vaccinated. While overall vaccine numbers are not as high as it would have hoped, One World will still help people work through their concerns. We take the time and we work through uh, their hesitancies and we try to use every opportunity to reintroduce it again. Even though we would want more people to get vaccinated, we should all still be thankful that, you know, we have a large amount of people vaccinated. So after all of this, what have we learned about responding to a pandemic like this one? Dr. Lawler tells me the lessons he's learned so far. I think we learned quite a bit uh, about COVID and, and the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, we, we certainly learned uh, the risks of not getting widespread vaccination early enough, and particularly the risks of not addressing the global problem uh, aggressively. We've seen the rise of a number of um, more transmissible and more dangerous variants over the course of 2021, and all of those variants arrived uh, from places where vaccination rates were relatively low, the latest being Omicron, which came out of South Africa, which had a vaccination rate of less than 25%. I think the other thing, unfortunately, we learned uh, in 2021 is the power of social media and the internet in uh, shaping people's um, thoughts and behaviors uh, about um, global issues. And I think the role of disinformation uh, in this pandemic will be one of the uh, unfor unfortunate but enduring lessons. Brought up Omicron there. Obviously, we're, we're dealing with what is the most contagious form of this virus yet. Um, and you spoke to it a little bit, but I guess, can you be a, a little more clear on how exactly we got to this point? It, it is the unvaccination of the rest of the world that, that caused this, right? Right. So any time you allow this virus, which like all RNA viruses has a high mutation rate, any time you give it an environment where you have a lot of infections going on with lots of virus in human hosts, and especially when you have imperfect immunity, so a population where you have partial vaccination or where you have people who've been previously infected, um, you provide the, the milieu where this virus is then driven to mutate and change in, into a virus that potentially can uh, increase transmissibility or at least uh, escape from prior immunity more effectively. And that's what's happened multiple times now with this pandemic and, and again, most recently with Omicron. So uh, it, it arose out of Southern Africa and now unfortunately has spread across the world and appears to be, as you said, the most transmissible version of the virus yet. What would you, uh, how would you categorize the danger level right now? You know, as we work through the holiday season, we're dealing with Omicron and we've got a whole bunch of pandemic fatigue in American society. It's almost like a perfect storm, it seems like. It really is. I, I'm very worried about where we are uh, at this current moment. From Omicron, certainly, it, it is so much more transmissible and explosive in its growth potential. We're seeing many, many more cases, um, much higher rates than we've seen in previous waves. Uh, it does appear that uh, it is less severe on an individual basis, but just the sheer volume of numbers may be enough to overwhelm the health system. So that's that's one issue. The second issue is uh, we don't know how less severe it will be in unvaccinated individuals. 
much of our data is coming from places where vaccination rates are much higher. And it does appear that like the, the other strains of the virus, vaccine provides pretty good protection against severe disease and hospitalization. So in populations where we have large numbers of unvaccinated, as we do in many areas of Nebraska, uh, we may see uh, significantly higher rates of hospitalization. And then the third thing is that we're now seeing uh, a normal flu season kicking into gear. Uh, the numbers we're seeing for flu cases seem to be what we would expect in, in a, a normal uh, to potentially worse than normal flu season. So when we combine those two things together, we arrive at a demand on our hospital system, which is, is really unsustainable and, and we don't have the capacity to manage. So the next couple of months are, are potentially gonna be pretty dicey. The message from Dr. Lawler there, still ahead, what could 2022 hold with the pandemic still raging on? Plus the concerns for our hospital systems as more patients check in for help fighting the virus. You're watching KETV Newswatch 7's Chronicle.